um, 90 minutes blocked, but kind of, I'm sort of thinking we'll, we'll do both presentations will be like 25 to 30 minutes each. And that'll just leave us some discussion time um, at the end of the session. Before we uh, get started with the presentations, just wanted to give everyone a quick opportunity to uh, say hello, uh, say uh, what institution you're uh, working with, and um, we'll, then we'll move into the presentation. So I'm Terry Brady, a software developer with uh, Georgetown. Uh, we, we run DSpace 5.8. What order do you want to do this in, Terry? Uh, you know, let me, <laughs> let me uh, I'll call people out based on the order I see. Uh, so David, uh, do you want to do an introduction? Hey, I'm David Corbley. I'm the Institution Repository Director at the University of Oklahoma. Not a developer, but interested in everything you guys do. Great. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Tom, do you want to uh, do an introduction? Um, hi, my name is Tom. Um, I'm a developer at Admire, one of the DSpace service providers. Great. And Monica, could you do a quick intro? Unmute. Unmute should help, right? I'm Monica Mesenkamp. I work at Princeton University. We have a DSpace Create PUI version 5.3, which we cover customization. Thanks. Tim? Yeah, hi all. This is Tim Donahue. I'm from DuraSpace. So I'm the DSpace tech lead at DuraSpace, and I also um, help out on our DSpace direct uh, service. I agree. Uh, Ryan, did you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ryan Shirley from the Dryad Digital Repository. Uh, we, we run a, an unversioned DSpace that includes pieces from lots of other versions. Yeah. All right, Pascal. Yeah, Pascal Becker. I'm running the library code to DSpace service provider. Great. And Patrick? My name is Patrick Trotze. I'm a student at Laurentian University. I'm, I'm tasked with upgrading the university's DSpace to 6.2. And I work for, uh, help out with Janitor as well, which is what I'm talking about today. Great. Thanks. Uh, Mike? Hi, I'm Mike Martilla. Uh, I work at Georgetown University with Terry and uh, Jason Brock, and I spend about half my time in development and half on sysadmin type stuff. Great. Thanks. Jason? Yep, uh, this is Jason Brock from Georgetown University. I'm a sysadmin, and uh, like Mike said, it's uh, it's me, Mike, and Terry um, doing a lot of stuff on uh, DSpace here at Georgetown. Great, and Mark? Mark Wood. Um, this is Sam, Indiana University in Indianapolis. Uh, we, we all have several D spaces here, an institutional repository and university archives, uh, a couple more specialized things. Uh, that's about all I can think of. Great, thanks. And Drew? Hello, uh, I tuned in a little bit late, so I'm not exactly sure what the question is. Oh, just uh, introduce yourself and uh, where you're from. Hi, I'm uh, Drew Hewlis. I'm at Johns Hopkins uh, in Baltimore. And um, I'm um, kind of by default the person most involved with DSpace on our campus and um, kind of reinvesting in updating and getting more fluent and using the system to better effect. All right, great you, great you could join us. All right, Tiffany. Everyone, I'm Tiffany. I'm an applications developer for University of Maryland Libraries. I just started a couple of weeks ago. I'm just learning about DSpace. Awesome, well, welcome. Glad you joined us. All right, and with that then, um, Tim, I'm gonna uh, lead it over to you to talk about uh, deploying uh, DSpace on AWS. And I wanna confirm that we're uh, starting to record. Yep, yeah, I started to record at the very beginning of all of this, so, so we're already recording here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen here. Let me get that going. OK, I think you should see a wiki page at this point in time, yes. uh, which is the wiki page for the meeting. 
Okay. Um, and first off, I do want to apologize. I'm a little bit under the weather today, so we're going to see how this goes. Um, uh, honestly, though, um, interrupt me if you have questions or comments or anything of that nature. Uh, but the gist of what I want to show off here today, and maybe this can kind of just get folks um, thinking about what you could show at future uh, developer show and tell meetings, is just sort of some of the stuff that I've done around um, Puppet and using uh, Cloud init scripts to kind of do basic deployments of DSpace. And it's not necessarily even specific to AWS. Um, it's more about using um, uh, tools like Puppet and Cloud Init to be able to deploy in any sort of cloud um, infrastructure. But, um, but I'm going to show how we use this um, to our advantage to kind of host the, uh, the demo.dspace.org site, how that site is actually set up, and how all the code for that site is actually out there in GitHub. So if you wanted to use it to base your own little deployment off of or whatever, you're welcome to go ahead and borrow it or, or hack something off of it or whatever you want to do. Um, so I'm going to show this actually as a completely live demo. I don't have slides or anything of that nature, uh, but we're going to talk through how this all works. And I, I welcome you to kind of like ask questions as we go um, and we'll kind of take it from there. Um, so in a separate window here, which I'm going to pull over, um, I'm logged into uh, the Amazon AWS Council. Uh, this is actually the account that our demo site is running off of. So if I go over to our, our list of instances, um, you can see demo.dspace.org is here as this instance that's running. Um, but what we're going to do here is we're going to launch a brand new instance um, using these scripts that are out here on GitHub uh, to bring up a copy of the demo site. And then we'll talk through how this is actually working and what's going on behind the scenes um, so you can get a sense of how you could potentially um, use this for other cloud deployments of dspace or other products altogether if you wanted to. Um, but in any case, uh, in order to actually make this uh, work within a allotted time, I'm going to kick this off and we're going to talk through this while we uh, wait for this to actually boot up. Uh, we'll talk through how it, what's happening and, and where this is all going. Uh, so I'm just going to choose a generic machine image here for Amazon. So Amazon calls each of their um, uh, servers different machine image. I, I tend to use Ubuntu, so I'm going to grab this Ubuntu image, this generic one, and select that um, for uh, the new server that we're, we're booting up. Right now, our demo site is using a, a sort of old generation instance type, which is a little bit smaller and cheaper, this M3 medium. Uh, you really could go with anything, but this has about almost four gigs of memory, uh, which is useful to be able to run Postgres, Tomcat, Apache, and DSpace all on the same server. You probably want at least that, if not more. Um, uh, so we're gonna go ahead and launch from that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and configure our instance details. Not a whole lot here, but I do want to give it a specific role. And I'll, I'm not, I'll talk through that here a little bit later on. We're not going to worry about anything else. Uh, the one thing that is of interest here is this advanced details. Um, user data uh, is stuff that you can pass to the server as it's actually um, spinning up. And so what we're going to pass in here is we're actually going to pass in a cloud init script. Um, to, to boot up the server and start everything up, including installing everything that DSpace needs. It'll kick off an installation of Tomcat, Postgres, um, Apache, and DSpace itself and spin everything up um, as the server boots up. So that cloud init script is available out on GitHub here. I've got all my links um, on this wiki page, um, but it's under this Puppet uh, DSpace demo uh, GitHub repository. So I'm going to open up this in a new tab. Okay, so we got our Puppet DSpace demo. This includes the Cloud Init scripts and the Puppet scripts that allow us to run uh, the demo site, and it's this Cloud Init YAML file. And we're gonna walk through this after I get it pasted in. So I'm just gonna grab it real quick, copy it exactly as is. We're gonna go over to our other window here and paste in this giant YAML file into our user data. So there's a ton of information in this YAML file, which we'll go through. A lot of it is comments, uh, which help you understand what's going on in the YAML file, and we'll walk through that here in a moment. Um, so I'm gonna go on the next step here, and instead of an eight gig uh, main drive, I'm gonna bump it up to 75. We don't really need another uh, drive here, and we will give it a quick tag, give this server a name, 
And we're just going to call this test space deployment. And then I have a security group already set up, which basically just opens up certain ports for this server by default. So you'll see we have our SSH port, HTTP, HTTPS, stuff for the handle server, all that sort of stuff that the demo site itself is using. So I'm just selecting that same security group. So it'll open up those same ports for me as the server boots up. So now we'll go ahead and uh, this just gives us a review of everything we selected, the server type, uh, the ports that are open, um, the YAML file that we uploaded is under this instance details. It's now all been encrypted in this really strange <laughs> user data encryption here. Uh, but we'll go ahead and launch that now. And I need to select my SSH key that I have locally, which will allow us to actually monitor what's going on here. We'll launch this. Okay, so while this is getting started, this is going to take about 15 minutes. So it gives us plenty of time to talk through what's going on as this uh, new server is spinning up. But you can see it doing its thing right here. Um, <clears throat> let's go back here to our Puppet DSpace demo uh, repository. So one thing to mention is this is in a different area of GitHub. If, if uh, you're a little bit newer to DSpace, we actually have two DSpace areas. There's the main DSpace repository area, which is all the production level stuff. And then there's also this labs area, uh, which is stuff that uh, some of it may be production ready. Other stuff is just stuff people are playing around with and, and messing with. And if you ever want to actually share some of your code here, get in touch with me or one of the other committers, and we can help you create a repository here so you can get things out there and have others uh, contribute to it. So that, that's where this Puppet DSpace demo code sits. Um, as I had mentioned, we have this cloud init script um, right here that tells cloud init what, what we're going to be doing. Uh, before we go through this, I'll note that there's some pretty good cloud init documentation over on cloudinit.io. Um, and the reason why I'm using cloud init in this situation is because it does work with many different uh, types of servers, so it's not Ubuntu specific. Uh, you can use it with any sort of your favorite server flavor. It also works uh, within various public clouds, so it's not AWS specific in any way. If you're using Google Cloud or Rackspace or whatever else, you can use cloud in it there as well. Um, so none of this that I'm showing you here today is at all AWS specific. But the cloud init configuration file, whoops, wrong tab. Cloud init configuration file is, is handled in this YAML file. Let me bump this up just to make sure folks can see it. Uh, there's plenty of documentation out off the website, but a lot of these things should be pretty straightforward and there are various configurations that you're basically passing a cloud init to configure on your server. So we're giving it a host name, we're giving it a fully qualified domain name, um, and these are on the server level. We're telling cloud init that it can manage our ETC hosts in order to configure those properly. Uh, we're telling cloud init that we want to add some new app sources, and some of these are commented out because it was testing stuff that I had done, but we're enabling some partner repositories in apt-get so that Ubuntu ca has access to certain things. Uh, we're telling it that the first time it boots up, it should run our update and our upgrade, which just says to make sure all the packages are up to date. So if you're familiar with apt-get, you'll be familiar with the update and upgrade on the first boot. Hey, Tim, can I ask one quick question? Sure. When you assign that um, uh, host name and the, um, the FQDN, are you going to have a collision with your the main demo.dspace.org when this? No, is? this just sets this up on the server. Uh, it's not doing anything at the um, actual DNS level. Okay. Um, so if I was to actually want to enable this at the DNS level, yes, it would show up as a collision. But you'll see the server is going to identify itself when we log into it, when we SSH into it. It'll say that it's called demo. Um, okay. But the, the DNS doesn't know anything about it. Um, what's going to get set up at the DNS level is it's just going to be a generic um, EC2 instance domain, uh, which we'll see in a minute when we SSH into it Thanks. and see how it's going. Um, so, so this is uh, just getting the basics set up. We can tell it then we want certain packages installed by default. We want wget. We want to make sure we have um, git and Ruby and Puppet 
and Python pip. And uh, pup, Ruby's only installed here in order for Puppet to run because uh, Puppet needs Ruby as well as our um, another uh, tool we're using down below here called Librarian Puppet to manage our Puppet dependencies. Um, Python pip is only being installed to install uh, AWS command line tools. Um, so these aren't absolutely required, but for our demo site, we're using this in a couple places, which you'll see below. So you can kind of list whatever packages you want apt-get to install from default um, in this file, and it will install those as the server boots up. And you can give it a bunch of commands, and these are just essentially shell commands uh, that tell it to run these shell commands in a specific order in order to install certain things or perform different tasks as the server boots up. Um, so this first one, uh, shows up as sort of an array just to pass several commands together here. So we're doing an sh call and telling it to do a um, set up some ssh uh, um, forwarding uh, configuration, ssh agent forwarding configuration just for easier ssh access. Uh, we're having pip upgrade itself to make sure it's in the latest version. We're having it then install the AWS tools um, to make sure we have those client tools available. We have RubyGems upgrade itself. Um, and here's where we actually get into stuff related to DSpace. So now we're going to um, set up uh, Puppet has been installed up above here as a package. And uh, the Puppet directory by default is this etc puppet. So we're going to remove the stuff that's currently there by default. And instead, we're going to clone what's in our uh, Puppet DSpace demo repository to that directory. So we're kind of clearing out that directory and putting our own Puppet scripts in there in order to set this up like the demo site. Um, those Puppet scripts actually have a, a reliance on uh, this tool called Librarian Puppet to actually install various Puppet dependencies, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But this is where we're kind of installing P Librarian Puppet, and then we tell Librarian Puppet, install all our Puppet dependencies on this next line. And then the final step here is we just tell Puppet, okay, run this script to install everything. And this is where the magic happens. It's really just in these four lines in terms of, along with all the puppet scripts, of course, in terms of actually getting everything to be set up properly in AWS or in any cloud, um, your cloud service of, of choice. Uh, the other things down here are pretty relatively straightforward. Um, this is kind of firewall, firewalling some EC2 information, which is not really necessary for other cloud. Um, cloud services, but it's just trying to make sure that certain stuff is only available to um, to root on the machine. It sets up our locale, sets up our time zone, says, um, okay, Cloud Init, we want everything you do to be logged to this log file, and we're going to go look at that log file on the server to see what all it's performed. And then the final message we want you to print in this log file is this specific uh, message once you're done with all of your processing. So that's the gist of the cloud, cloud init script here and what it's doing. Um, we're gonna go through a little bit of the library and puppet stuff and puppet stuff in just a moment, but I wanna go over and see, um, let's take a look at how our server's booting up. And we're gonna do that by going back to our instance here. Okay, so it's running. Uh, it's probably still in the process of installing everything because uh, the actual DSpace build process, as you're all probably aware, takes a little while. Uh, but we have a public DNS that it is reporting as down here. So I'm going to copy that to my clipboard. And then I have a command line over here that I'm going to pull over. Uh, this is just an SSH command using the SSH key that I had configured that I had locally. This server is going to uh, have, have a root user of Ubuntu. And now I'm going to paste in um, our DNS name for this server. It's a brand new server, so i got to trust it. Okay, and it's already started to do some things because we're already seeing that it's responding as welcome to demo.dspace.org. Uh, but if we go to our var log directory, this is where I told it to log everything. Let's do a quick tail of the cloud init to see how far along we are. How long was I talking? Okay, so it's still doing some puppet installation here, um, going step by step and trying to get things um, installed little by little. And we'll go ahead and let that run. Um, so it's still installing things like the Postgres uh, server setup, Apache, um, various things are being installed on the server uh, using those Puppet scripts. But let's jump over and look at how it's doing this via the Puppet scripts. Let me get this window out of the way. 
Let me just pull this over to the side real quick. Okay, so I had mentioned that um, we pulled down this Git repository. We're using library and Puppet to install dependencies, and then we're calling a Puppet script. These things are all within this GitHub repository here. So let's jump over and look at that a little bit more closely. So here's our Puppet DSpace demo repository. Um, it's a very small amount of code in here because it's relying on a lot of other things that are third-party tools as well as um, our own Puppet DSpace tools. So there's not a whole lot here. We had our Cloud init script, which we copied in to actually get this all running. Uh, we have another thing called a Puppet file, which is what Library and Puppet uses. Um, library, library and Puppet is this tool from uh, LibraryandPuppet.com that basically allows you to uh, pull in dependencies somewhat dynamically, uh, various Puppet modules, and it's relatively straightforward. It's through this uh, configuration file. So you can see different Puppet modules I'm pulling in different versions of them. So I'm pulling in some um, Puppet unattended upgrades. This just ensures the, the server gets upgraded automatically on a regular basis, and I'm pulling in a specific version of this Puppet module. Uh, we're pulling in some standard libraries that Puppet Labs distributes um, that makes things easier to work with in Puppet. And here's where we get into the dependencies. So we're using a third-party module called Puppet Labs Postgres and a Puppet Labs Tomcat and a Puppet Labs Apache. So these are all third-party modules that are used to obviously install these dependencies. And I'm grabbing in various versions of these modules. And then at the very bottom, I'm grabbing in a custom uh, DSpace DSpace module that is pointing at our Puppet DSpace Git repository. So it's basically saying now we're going to use this and we're going to call it DSpace DSpace. That's the name of this module. So this is where I'm installing all, the, all of my dependencies, making sure they're all in the server and available to our Puppet scripts. And then if we go over to the file that it was running, um, if you remember from the uh, Cloud init script, it was running a site.pp file. This is the entire site.pp, which basically is a Puppet uh, script that will then call all those dependencies and set them up. Um, so I'm going to skip some of this just for the essence of time. I don't want to take up too much time here, uh, but, but um, I'm welcome to, I, I welcome any questions on this as we go um, or later on as well. So we have a, a DSpace module class that you can see I'm setting it up to use Java 8. I'm telling it I want this specific version of Postgres and Tomcat. I'm going to set up a, an OS user that I want this to, to utilize um, and a database name, owner, um, some dummy passwords here, a port that I want it running on, and all those sort of things. So this is all kind of configuring this, this DSpace Puppet module, uh, which is available in GitHub again, which we'll glance at here again in a little bit. Um, then I'm saying, OK, I want our DSpace owner to be set up as the owner that I configured in this above module, which is the same as this line up here, this owner. So I want it to be uh, this DSpace um, OS account is going to be our owner of our DSpace repository. Um, and it, we're going to make it a pseudo user. We're going to um, set up some other things here, which are very specific to the demo site, where this is usually actually pulling down our committer um, SSH keys, so all the committers have access to this demo site. Um, so this is stuff you wouldn't necessarily want locally, but I'm able to actually use AWS command line tools to sync stuff from storage in Amazon to actually pull it down to the server and set it up so that the committers immediately have SSH access into the server using their own SSH keys. But here's where we get into installing prerequisites. So I have a wrapper uh, function here. Uh, within our DSpace module that says, okay, I'm going to set up a Postgres database. I'm going to give it a, a name that I configured above again, and I'm going to um, require that it happens after I've installed that owner account. Um, and that that's because it's going to be installed under that owner user, um, as we'll see here in a moment. Um, I've given it a PG pass file so we don't have to authenticate um, on the command line. I'm setting up a Tomcat instance and telling it where I want it installed at. Uh, under that owner account again, um, and I have to wait for that owner account to be um, installed first. Um, we're going to provide a, a, a sim link here just to sim link it up properly. We're setting up a, a Apache site on this server and telling it we want it to be called demo.dspace.org so it can, re can respond like that. Um, it can have SSL and it requires that a Tomcat instance is first set up so it can forward all its requests to Tomcat. Uh, we're going to set up a 
local.cfg file, which is what's required now for DSpace 6, and we're pulling that down from Amazon in this case. Uh, you could just as soon um, pull that down from another location or configure it within um, some other sort of com command in Puppet itself to create it. And then finally, we're going to actually install DSpace um, into the owner account. Um, we're going to use a specific uh, get, get repo and pull on a specific branch to install DSpace from. Uh, we're going to use the local config file that we installed up there and give it some parameters to actually install everything. Uh, the rest of this is just some stuff that we use to monitor our um, demo site. So we use a tool called PSI Probe to do Tomcat troubleshooting, and that's installed um, there. And then we use your kit to do some Java profiling, and that's installed here. And then we also set up a splash page to look at, make it look pretty. Um, and that's installed in this section here. And there's some other scripts to actually set up some AIPs to install initial content and all that. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but this, this is where all the magic happens in terms of actually setting up the server and getting everything installed for DSpace and all those prerequisites. And as you saw, it relies very heavily on um, this DSpace module, all these DSpace install commands, DSpace Apache site commands, all of those things are actually over in our Puppet uh, DSpace module here, which is in our main DSpace repository. Um, those are all scripts within this module. So we have various scripts here. There's the Apache site script to actually set up Apache and make it run uh, how DSpace sort of expects it to. And it can have some default configurations at the, at the, uh, in the top configuration and how, it's all, how it does all the Apache uh, configuration setup is all within this script. Uh, we have a script then to install a Postgres database, which um, sets up again some default configurations uh, and uh, does the actual Postgres server installation and a Postgres database installation by calling the third party Postgres module that we had pulled in from library and puppet. And then we have the same thing for Tomcat scripts to actually, most of these are just wrapper scripts. They're really just kind of doing some basic setup and then they call off to the third party um, module that we've installed to actually do a, most of the setup. So a lot of this is very lightweight code that wraps um, the third party modules and sets up everything in a way that DSpace tends to accept, expect everything to be set up. So it ensures that the Tomcat user is running as the same user that uh, the DSpace installation is and things of that nature that we all know um, are required for a DSpace setup. Tom, uh, Tim, may I ask you a general sure. question? Yeah. So I know that Puppet is a tool for deployment in general. Why do we need Puppet Librarian? What's the difference or specialization of it? Um, Puppet Librarian, here, let me go to the thing. It basically allows you to pull in, you don't necessarily need to use it. I just find it an easy way to pull in various modules in a dynamic fashion. Um, so it, like I said, it has this simple idea of a puppet file that lets you pull in things from what's called the Puppet Lads Forge, which is kind of where all these libraries are, um, are registered. It's a registry of puppet libraries. And you can just refer to them by name and by their version number or you can point to specific modules at a GitHub repository. So it's a very kind of easy way to either pull in modules that are either registered with Puppet Forge or just available out there on GitHub. And so I find it useful personally. Um, if, uh, it's not necessarily a requirement to use it if you wanted to use Puppet, uh, but it's just the way that I've tended to do things. So um, it's just another tool that's out there that folks may not be aware of that might uh, might spark some ideas. And it's kind of cool in that it can pull in even specific GitHub repositories and give you a specific version number. So this is like a release number within that GitHub repository. So you can kind of limit it to specific branches that you want or release numbers. Um, and it's just kind of does this all in a much more dynamic fashion. And we can show how these all get installed on the server once the server's done setting up. Go ahead. Great. And this DSpace module, is this a module you wrote for Puppet Librarian or does it doesn't have anything to do with the librarian stuff? It has nothing to do with Puppet Librarian stuff. It's a module that simply um, uh, installs DSpace and all the prerequisites. So it, it installs Java, Maven, Ant, and Get. Um, right now, the module is kind of specific to Ubuntu or Debian servers. So if you tried it elsewhere, it may not work um, so well. But if you wanted to contribute and help 
help enhance this more for others, I would welcome it. But it was actually a module that I wrote initially for uh, Vagrant DSpace. So this same module is used both for, for setting up Vagrant DSpace to do a Vagrant VM locally, if you want to use that, as well as uh, for setting up the demo site. So it's used in both of those two situations to install DSpace and get all the prerequisites set up. So it installs the basic prerequisites and then it allows you to have these wrapper scripts that if you want to install Tomcat, you can do so. You just have to also include that Puppet Labs, Tomcat, um, third-party dependency. If you want to install Postgres, you can do so. You just also must include that dependency as well. Um, and there's an Apache one as well, which it looks like I forgot to document here. Um, but again, it's just kind of a set of scripts that may be useful to you if you wanted to, to enhance them or utilize them locally. So Wait. Tim, uh, yep. the modules rely on, like the Tomcat module or Postgres module, are they also dependent on, uh, on Ubuntu or are they able to no. work different? Most of these third-party modules are built by Puppet Labs, which are the people who actually uh, make Puppet. Um, and they make a ton of these modules for Puppet for major um, tools like Tomcat, Apache, Postgres. So this is the Tomcat one that they build. Um, and if you scroll down into this, there's somewhere in here, actually maybe it's easier to look at the Puppet Forge. They also have this Forge, which is where you, yeah, here's where the dependencies are. Um, so Puppet Labs Tomcat works on Red Hat, Ubuntu, Debian, all these various OSs. Um, it does require certain versions of, Tom, of Puppet to be installed. Um, and then there's all, all, all kinds of various versions of this that, that, uh, that you can utilize as well. Uh, they have all the various release numbers down here too. So each of these modules are third party and they are not at all Ubuntu specific. The only one that's Ubuntu specific is the one that I wrote for DSpace. And that's only because I'm, that's what I'm most familiar with. And like I said, I, I set it up both for Vagrant and the demo.dspace.org site, both of which currently use Ubuntu. So if you were to make your module, say, work for Red Hat, you would put some kind of if statement into your site PP file or in certain locations so you wouldn't call app get but yum. Is that how it works? Um, you would have to, uh, that, would, that, that would take more training on Puppet. You could look at how they do it within these various Puppet Labs modules. So the, they have, like I mentioned, a Tomcat, there's an Apache one. Um, all of their modules support multiple um, OSs. So, um, and I admit, I, I, don't, I don't think we have time to go into how to do this via Puppet per OS, but yes, you could, at a basic level, if you wanted to create a Red Hat specific one, you could either just remove the stuff that's Ubuntu specific and stick the Red Hat stuff in, or yeah, you could have a if statement that looks at the environment um, and instead of doing apt, sort of calls you could do um, uh, yum or, or other sort of calls. Right, so basically the Puppet Labs code senses the environment and then in certain places they do the appropriate stuff. Correct, yeah, Puppet has a lot of tools um, and environment variables that it sets up itself that can sense what environment you're running under. Um, okay. So it can know okay. what- okay. Yeah, that kind of answers running. the question. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's the basics of how it all works. Um, so if we go back over to the command line, and I'm running out of time here, it is almost finished installing DSpace. <laughs> um, it's running through all of the uh, build and installation process. I'm gonna exit out of this uh, looking at the var log, but we, we can go look and see what it did do here. So an ETC puppet is where everything got installed. Um, and if we look here closely, um, we have this manifest directory, which is what we brought down. Um, if we look at what's in there, that's from our GitHub repository, it just has that site.pp. Uh, but there's also now this modules directory, which did not exist in our, um, in our uh, GitHub repository. And if you look at what's in there, that's where it pulled down all these dependencies. This is where Library and Puppet does its work. So pull down the DSpace Puppet module, the Postgres Puppet module, uh, the Tomcat one, the Apache one and a couple other ones here that they're dependent on because Puppet modules can declare certain dependencies. Um, and so this is where all those modules got pulled down by Librarian Puppet and installed globally so that now um, Puppet has access to them and can, can create everything. Um, and I know this is still installing, but what's gone on here is if we look, there's now a DSpace account 
on this server. Um, and it's still in progress here, uh, but we can see we have a DSpace installation directory. We have our DSpace source code. Uh, it looks like it's still in the process of uh, setting up some of these other things. There should eventually be a Tomcat uh, sim link that goes off to where Tomcat's installed and a Postgres sim link that goes off to where Postgres is installed. Um, but you can see it's kind of um, in progress of all, of all of this. Are there other questions I can answer while I'm... Tim, uh, just a quick question uh, to sure. understand that I understand how Puppet works. It's doing the work on an operating system. It's not containerized, right? Correct. Um, okay. Yeah, so this so is really basically like, like a server in the cloud. Um, so it's not at all yeah. containerized. This is not using Docker or anything like that. I'm, no, okay, that's I right. spun up an EC2 server in the cloud. Oh, and it just finished. So we got our, our finish uh, complete. You can see it took over a thousand seconds. So it takes a while to get everything booted up, but everything was successful. Yeah. And so now if we go back to our DNS name, let me copy that to the clipboard. And let's see, it may take a little while here for it to actually become responsive. Um, but momentarily here as Tomcat and everything boots up, uh, we will actually see uh, the demo site, the DSpace demo site at this URL and that everything was set up within this 15 minute span by CloudInit and, and the Puppet scripts. Cool. But that's the gist of what I wanted to show off. It's not, none of this is really fancy into AWS tools, so it's not using a lot of the AWS he heavy stuff, but it allows you to see how you could do this in other cloud deployments. And like I'd mentioned, a lot of the basis for this is also what is used in the Vagrant DSpace um, VM environment. So if you want to run local VMs, uh, look at Vagrant DSpace. It uses these same puppet tools to actually um, set up uh, DSpace and all its prerequisites on a local virtual machine. Hey, Tim, I've got a couple other questions. What, what will sure. like just this setup end up costing you when you get your AWS bill? And it depends on entirely on what server type you selected. Uh, so I selected a medium server, which is relatively cheap. I think it's about uh, 10 cents an hour to run or something like that, but it's 10 cents an hour. So you got to add that out. Um, and then it also depends on actual activity um, in terms of numbers of downloads and things of that nature. So if it's a very highly active site, um, I couldn't really give you numbers for for that. And I don't know that off the top of my head what the numbers are for the demo site for DSpace. That's something I would have to go go dig into a little bit. Okay, um, but I, I presume then if it, it's not it's not a huge huge cost to keep demo.dspace.org running. Uh, no, it's not a massive cost. Um, I don't know what the exact cost is, but I think it's maybe in the hundred or so a year, hundred dollars or so a year to run, maybe a couple hundred a year. Uh, I know it's not in like the thousands per year, um, but I but it's somewhere in maybe the hundred or two hundred per year to run the DSpace demo site. Yeah, and one of the, would you ever like use this box that you've spun up as an actual uh, development box as well, where you you know. You could. Um, so I admit I don't tend to do it, use AWS as much for that, but I use these exact same tools in Vagrant DSpace. So I use Vagrant DSpace more for development environment locally so that I can have a local virtual machine. Um, but you very well could just as soon do that in Amazon. You will be accruing a little bit of cost there uh, because you'll have to pay per hour uh, for what you're running in Amazon. But if you remember to shut down these servers relatively regularly or just rebuild them relatively regularly, it wouldn't be a, a massive cost um, on your behalf. Uh, actually, on that note, uh, I have a server that I schedule with the Lambda, Amazon Lambda script, that just goes down at the end of the workday and comes up the next day. Mm -hmm. And I have another one with the same script, similar setup, it just never comes up. It automatically comes down at the end of the day. But if I need it, I just start it up from the command line. So that would be a way. Like I and, and the way I use DSpace, by the way, like we have a product, we have two instances, and both of them exist in production and QA. But the QA instances aren't really used all that much. Okay. Uh, you could spin up an instance and you just shut it down and only bring it up when you need it. Right. 
right? Yeah, yeah, I would recommend something like that. I admit I haven't dug into that as much as you have, Monica, but maybe you could share some of those tools or links to some of those, some of what you've done there. Because that would be- uh, I have to, I think it lives in a private repository, yeah, but I, I, I can share some of them. It looks like my server's yeah, taking a while to boot up here. Go ahead. Yeah, that'd be great to share. And you could even link in some samples of the Lambda, the AWS Lambda script that you have. That well, yeah, that's does the that main thing I basis. did. It's just the yep. Lambda script, uh, and it's based on uh, this AWS Python command line API, whatever, Bodo. Right, stuff. and that's actually what I had installed here, that AWS CLI tools. That's those Python right. um, scripts. So it's probably very similar to some of the tools that I um, that are being installed automatically here. I just right, don't right, land right. a script that does that. So that might be useful to to share. So yeah, I yeah. don't know if I want to take up any more time. It looks like my server is taking a while to to start up here. Probably Tomcat is still um, messing with trying to get DSpace fully deployed. It seems to be hanging and then and then eventually timing out. But I know any minute here, it will suddenly pop up and we'll see the demo site. Well, then look, maybe what we can do is um, like af after Patrick's demo, we can uh, pop back and um, see the status of, of your server. Sure. Give it a little more. Yeah, it, it'll essentially look exactly like this. It'll end up with yeah. the same splash page and all of that. Um, and it'll look exactly like the current demo site. But uh, but right now, as you can see, it's still trying to, to do its thing. I think Tomcat's just working hard still um, and getting it all running. But I'll go ahead and stop sharing here uh, so I can hand things over to Patrick and we can look back at this later. Yeah, thanks so much. This was great to see. Sure. Thank you. Um, can I have another note of Tomcat though? Is that a process that runs in single thread or is it a multi-thread parallel process? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the Tomcat, the Tomcat question. Yes, uh, Tomcat, does it run in, like, is there multiple processes in parallel running, or should it just be a single process that runs full CPU? Uh, Did that? I am not sure off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, no worries. If anyone knows, I... I'm trying to remember whether it has multi-processes under the services, but I think it depends on how many web apps you have up and here, let me share my screen real quick again here. I actually just popped up. Oh, cool. We'll just show the DSpace 6.2 demo site just came here. Same nice. URL. Um, and if we go into the actual DSpace uh, sites themselves, it may take a moment to load because, again, the first time you hit DSpace, oftentimes it, it takes a moment to kind of initialize the, the site. But you can see it's the exact same setup as our demo site with all the same splash pages and all that. See if I can get the JSP UI to load quicker. Yeah, Tomcat's just being slow for me, but it is working. <laughs> it's just taking a little bit of time. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing here again. Patrick, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Nice, nice presentation. Uh, oh no, actually. Okay, it looks like I won't be able to share my screen because um, I'm using a new process called Wayland, and it's not uh, supported by Zoom, it looks like. Uh, there might be something I can do, but I'd have to like reboot back into the meeting. Uh, or let me have a look. Yeah, and we can certainly, we can, we can have a conversation for a couple minutes if that, because definitely it'd be great, great to be able to see your desktop. So just let us know. Okay, for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll actually exit and right I'll just try and see if I can reboot into uh, another graphics driver. Okay. Be back soon. Oh, and Tim, uh, I think you're on mute. If uh, I don't know if you're talking. Oh, you. yes, yes. I was just I was saying I was showing that I do have the XML UI and the JSP UI both loaded now under that same URL. So the deployment ended up being successful. Um, so I figured I'd share that briefly. Right now, there's no content in here because the demo uh, site does not actually add the content uh, during the deployment process. But we could do that afterwards. And then, so Tim, if you stop this server, 
um, and then start it back up. I assume it's just like the same amount of time it takes to reboot a, a server. So a couple minutes and then it would be back up yep. and running. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's just like rebooting a server. It's like turning the power button off on your server. Um, so right now it's running, um, but yeah, I could stop it. Uh, there's two different things on Amazon. You can either uh, stop a server, which is just like pushing the power button and you can bring it back up or you can terminate, which means it actually destroys it. So if you terminate it, you'd have to do this whole process again of launching a new instance using the cloud init script and all that. But if you just uh, stop it, you can start it back up easily. And if, if you stop it, then I assume there's still some small cost to maintain the image. Yes, so. yeah. What, what ha this has created is, okay, so it's a certain instance type. It also has created what's called a volume, which is the storage. Um, uh, and this is the volume it created, this test D space deployment volume. Um, it's a 75 gig volume. So you are paying um, some amount of cost to maintain this volume being here. Um, it's not, not a huge cost, but, uh, but it's not zero. So you would still be paying a small cost even when the server is shut down. The only way to get rid of that cost altogether would be to terminate it entirely and then spin back up from scratch. Are there any other questions I can answer while we're waiting for Patrick to come in or anything else anybody wants to talk about with any of this? Nope. On top, it pulls all these Maven dependencies which uh, is a bit of traffic, I assume. So do you pay for that? For pulling in the Maven dependencies? Yeah, because you go out to Maven repository sites and you keep pulling all these dependencies, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean everything. Go ahead. You know, for the Gale, I think the network traffic is what's being asked about. Right. Right. Yeah, so for... For Amazon, I don't have the prices off the top of my head here, but yes, there is cost for network traffic. Um, but I find that the costs tend to be more on the downloading side than the getting stuff to AWS. That's not in all cases, um, but they obviously want you to get stuff into AWS so you're dependent on them. Um, oh. uh, use their <laughs> services. So they make that as cheap as possible. Um, but then actually downloading stuff from AWS um, or people are downloading files from your D space or just even accessing the web pages, which is pretty minimal, but it's still a HTML download. Um, uh, that's where you do get some costs depending on the, uh, the activity on the server. Um, so I, I, don't, I really don't have good um, numbers for what those are in AWS. Um, off the top of my head. Um, I would be curious to hear more from others who have done this as well to see if they've had large scale sites in AWS. And I could get some numbers probably from our DSpace Direct service, which does host production sites in AWS for this purpose um, and does so in a way that is very similar to the way this Puppet script is, uh, does things um, for all of our hosted sites. But I don't have those off the top of my head. Yeah. So that's a good point that it's easier to get stuff in than bring it out. Right. Yeah. Most of these services are costed that way where they want you to get stuff in really cheap, but once you get it out, it, it may cost a little bit. Mm -hmm. None of these costs are significant, but they can add up over time, of course. Uh, can I ask a question on how you would update these space using Puppet? Like for example, if I change the team, then how, do I, how would you redeploy these space? with this setup? Um, currently, that is not uh, in, in the Puppet DSpace module. Uh, where's our, uh, well, here, let me get to the, so the Puppet DSpace module that we have only does the initial installation. And then after that, you do have to kind of manage it yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I've done this a little bit on the DSpace direct service side of things, which I've not been able to, to make uh, fully open source yet, but hoping to kind of move it over to that just whenever I can. But essentially you can do the same, um, same concept that you would normally do manually. So if you look at the installation process, there's an, in the installation script here, you'll see that a lot of what's happening is it's calling these exec commands, which for Puppet is really just kind of a command line um, uh, CLI stuff. So here we're actually doing get commands to clone stuff down 
um, and then we check out the branch that we want. Um, and then when we actually do the build, it's just a Maven build. So there's not a whole lot, Puppet's just wrapping the normal command line mm -hmm. um, tools that you use. So, so the way we do this with DSpace Direct is there's, there's some exec commands that instead of just doing a normal um, Maven package uh, would, um, would actually uh, trigger an, an upgrade where you do a Maven package and instead of running the ant, um, ant install, you'd run an ant update. Um, so let's see. And actually, wait, it looks like some of that is in here. I mm -hmm. just realized install DSpace via ant. So it's saying if the installation directory exists, we're going to do an ant update. Otherwise, we're going to run an ant fresh install. Um, so some of that is in here. I admit, I don't remember adding that. Maybe somebody else enhanced this <laughs> um, since I did that. Um, but, uh, but, but that's the gist of how you would sort of do this sort of thing is you would, um, you would trigger a redeployment. And you, with Puppet, you can actually have it watch specific files. So you can say, if, if my local config changed, um, the next time I read Puppet, rebuild and redo everything. And that's actually what it's doing here, the subscribe. It's subscribing to the file that's this local CFG file. So if there's changes to that file, then the next time you run Puppet, it's going to redo this build, and then it's going to notify the exec to reinstall. So this actually may work for updates. So you I would just rerun it. Puppet Apply? Yes, you'd rerun the same Puppet Apply command with the same, passing it the same script. The way Puppet works is it, it essentially uh, compares your current server state, uh, what, what is installed on the server, with what's in the commands that it's running. So anything that it finds that is different, it corrects, essentially. Um, so so it, it remembers the, like the last modified date time of the local.cf. It does, file. it even checks, it does a checksum of it. Oh, yeah. um, so it, it checksums the local CFG and it says, okay, this local CFG has changed. So now I know that since this thing subscribed to your local CFG, I gotta rerun this command and then after I rerun this command, this triggers a notify. It says, okay, whenever this command reruns, you also rerun this command. Um, and so that kind of, um, that triggers that process. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, one other way to do this is to architect it completely differently to have the database in an RDS server and have the assets store in a separate volume. And then you would just uh, re, we do a completely new machine that attaches to the database and the asset store. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really, that gets into much more AWS specific tools. So what Monica's talking about is Amazon has a RDS service, which is kind of a remote database service, I think is what it stands for, which allows you to run the database separately in the cloud so you don't have to have it on your server. Um, you can also store files <laughs> excuse me, um, separately as well, using other Amazon specific tools. So yes, you could do this um, much more Amazon specific, um, but right now these tools are, are, are kind of specifically meant to not be Amazon specific, just to allow people to get started in any environment they choose. But you're correct, there's lots of other ways you can enhance this um, for specific services. So do we have Patrick back yet? I checked in with him. He's still having some uh, trouble getting his uh, environment working. Uh, so it we can may it may make sense to um, save his demo for the next uh, discussion. It sounds like for the next meeting, it sounds like we've got got a lot of good conversation around what you've showed, Tim. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me as well. If he's willing to reschedule for next time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so one wish that I've had is um, that somehow there could be just a clickable environment to, to build up a test uh, DSpace area. So often one of the things I'll find is I'm testing some of our local changes on our test servers, and I don't really want to destroy that environment and progress to test something out for DSpace, particularly like if I am in the course of a day testing something in DSpace 7, then in DSpace 6, then returning back to DSpace 5. And it would be, uh, it, it would be really interesting if there's some way to easily 
provision these resources for testing purposes <laughs> and for development purposes? I think this is pretty close because what Tim did on the console, starting a server with certain parameters, and then that kicked off the whole process, you could probably write a simple Python script that anything you can do on the console, you can do via uh, calling command line, command line commands, basically. And so you could develop the simple script that just does whatever he did clicking away with the simple command. Yes, yeah, I agree with Monica. It's, it would be totally possible to either do that as a Python script or possibly even via um, AWS cloud formation, which is... Uh, no, you wouldn't do that, that, but you could do, a, you could do a bash script calling the AWS command line, the, yeah. the AWS commands, right? Yeah, you definitely can call AWS commands to do everything I did there, because I didn't do anything right. magical. I just started up a new instance and I passed it the cloud init script. Right. Um, and that was the gist of what it was. There's some other things that were set up mm -hmm. prior, like uh, which ports to open up and, and which SSH key to use and things like that. Um, but the gist of it was relatively simple. Right, so you could imagine having like three almost identical commands that would start up a version five, a version six, and a version six with some other settings, and just the like, dude from the command line. You'd have to wait 15 minutes before it comes up, and then you'd throw it away. Yep. Yeah, it's definitely doable. It's not something I've ever written myself, but I would encourage others to, to kind of build off of that. That's kind of what this whole idea of these developer show and tell things are is to try and share what we've done mm -hmm. and see if we can figure out ways to improve upon it or work together on various aspects. Yes, yeah, so speak, speaking of which, I, I'm uh, just sharing my desktop back out to um, point out to you all that, that we do have this developer show and tell meeting page um, on the wiki. And so as, as any ideas come to mind, um, feel free to log them here. Also just kind of register um, if you're interested. So I, I, based on, since we had a great turnout today, I'll, I'll um, plan to schedule a follow-up one of these. I'll see if Patrick's available to um, present at the next one. And we already, even from prior brainstorming, have a handful of other potential topics. So, you know, I'd say as long as we've got interest and we've got topics, um, I'm happy to help you know, uh, uh, set these up on a uh, somewhat regular basis. And I'll, I'll also kind of once Tim has the video of this meeting uploaded, we'll link it out to the individual meeting page and then kind of start, start a planning cycle for the next meeting. Probably I'll, I'll likely go for um, similar time of day, maybe same day of the week since this uh, seems less likely to conflict with other regular DSpace meetings. Yeah, I think that all sounds great, Terry. And thank you, honestly, for getting this all set up and kickstarted. I think this will be a, a great meeting to have on occasion to just learn from each other. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm glad uh, folks uh, jumped in. Any other, I mean, we still have time if folks have any uh, general questions or things they want to talk about, or we can plan to reconvene in a follow-up meeting. I don't have, go ahead. I was wondering about you know, your specific question, Terry, about you know, having different instances going that you may you know, bring up and down. Uh, do you really need a whole machine for in, for instance, or would it do just to have a you know a Tomcat context, a you know a database on the instance somewhere? Um. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, it's kind of like my, like between what Tim showed today and then the, the experimentation I've sort of done on my own uh, with Docker, it's kind of, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around all the possibilities uh, that there are. I mean, uh, 
a nice thing with these full instances are if, if you are working on something that requires some conversation, they're easy to share with other people and have other people mm -hmm. take a look at your work. So I think it's important sometimes to have that capability. And then other times, uh, you know, maybe a more minimal installation is all you really need. Yep. Yeah, I'd yeah. agree with that. And in fact, I, I think that that's where it gets back to what Monica was mentioning about different AWS tools that you could be leaning on more heavily here. Um, so if you use something like Amazon RDS, the remote database um, setup, you could actually have three databases in there, one for DSpace 5, DSpace 6, and like the latest version for master or whatever. And then you could do this all in one server potentially. Um, so that's just, there's many different ways you can deploy things in the cloud. Um, I, this just was a very simplistic uh, way of kind of just getting a all in one server uh, set up running um, if that's what you want. I know another, another idea that I floated around sometime last year was, um, you know, would, would it, like, it's, it's so great that we have demo.dspace.org available, but would it ever be possible for our other supported versions that are in production to have like a demo.dspace.org that runs the latest version five? And I guess, I guess since four is still supported, one that could run the latest version four. So we just always be able to, you know, click in and see the, I, actually not only run the latest release, but run the latest active branch uh, for each of the, the maintained branches, just so that um, it's always accessible without needing to build locally. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, Terry. We could, I mean, with these tools that I just showed off today, you could definitely do that. Um, I think the hardest parts would be in uh, the dependencies areas, just making sure that DSpace 4, of course, has different Postgres dependencies than DSpace 5 and DSpace 6. So you'd have to kind of have different, potentially different versions of Postgres installed and things of that nature. But you, otherwise, you could use the same tooling to potentially spin up three or four different servers. Um, and then it becomes a matter of just costing it out to make sure that it's not an extravagant mm -hmm. cost. But, so in your experience, uh, what do you pay more for, for the server or for the traffic that the server generates? Uh, in my experience, it tends to be the, the server itself is a little bit more pricey and the storage, uh, like in uh, volumes, the number of volumes, depending on how big the, the storage volumes are. Um, those plus, if you're doing server backups, which Amazon calls snapshots, um, those can add up a little bit as well, depending on how frequently you snapshot things. But I, I why do like, you even snapshot stuff? Uh, well, in production, you'd want to. It's a server backup. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean for demo, demo, demo. You, demo we don't. <laughs> no, I no. Um, so yeah, it depends on what your question is referring to. If you're talking about demo specifically, then yeah, it's basically right, storage, right. So so what would support. be what would stop you from having? three demo servers, one being five, the other one six, the other one whatever. Um, I think it's really a matter of making sure we get the right pre prerequisites installed. I'm not sure these same scripts would work for all the way back to DSpace 4. They might, um, but I'm pulling in third party libraries, as I'd mentioned, to install Tomcat and Postgres and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what versions off the top of my head those are installing in all situations and whether those versions will match up with what DSpace 4 expects. So, so I think that's one thing that I've not looked into. But other than that, um, uh, yeah, it should just be a matter of uh, making sure that the costs are not extravagant for our budget because we don't exactly have a massive budget uh, for D space, but uh, but this doesn't seem like a significant cost. So it's something I can look into and report back on and bring to the D space steering group as well. Because it seems to me the people cost of re-architecting and doing something complicated in terms of running three D space instances and one VM would be more expensive than just running three instances. That. That's correct, but but you're assuming that uh, we're paying for the people costs. We are <laughs> people costs are oh. free because they're all volunteer. 
<laughs> and, and, yeah. for, it's like, and, and for me, part of my, my wondering is, and, and I, I don't really know how to know if this is a, a real issue we've encountered or not, but let's say we, we find a new developer who's really interested in contributing, but is just sort of overwhelmed by the work it takes to spin up a working instance. Would, would there be a way to carve out a really convenient uh, sort of development environment, development platform for someone? Um, and, I, and I hope at a future meeting to talk about some of the stuff I've done with the Code Envy service that tries to go in that direction, just to like, say, reduce the barriers for folks to get involved with the project and contribute, um, even if they don't have a robust infrastructure of their own to work with. How do you do remote debugging? That's the question, right? Yeah. All right, well, folks, anything else people want to talk about? Hello, everyone. Just one, uh, one last minute question. Tim, do you use any AVS, Amazon specific stuff? Anything automatic there? Or is it just some server that's spinned up with the uh, cloud stuff, cloud, cloud script? Um, nothing in, in what I showed off today is Amazon specific. It's, it, there are things that, that I mentioned which were Ubuntu or Debian specific, namely that Puppet DSpace module. Um, but everything else is generic for any any um, cloud service platform. So you could use this on Google Cloud or whatever other one you want to use. And is there anything that um, updates on a regular basis all the packages, the so Tomcat, the Apache, whatever? Yeah, I, I kind of glanced over because it wasn't something to really point out too much, but there is a Puppet module that I installed that was called Und Unattended Upgrades or Updates. Um, which is a puppet module that basically Great. triggers a cron job to do apt get upgrades and upgrade upgrade updates on a regular basis. Um, so that does get set up on this server automatically. Great, thank you. And I see uh, Patrick has um, rejoined, but Patrick, one possibility we were talking about was just um, rescheduling your presentation for a follow up. Okay, uh, everyone can hear me now. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that's fine, actually. Um, but if anyone is interested, if you just uh, visit janitor.technology um, and on our GitHub page, we're working a bit on getting that set up and we're almost there and it'll be exciting to share the project. But unfortunately, well, I, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna probably boot up Windows on my laptop next time because uh, there's an issue with the graphics driver here. Um, so apologize for that, everyone. Well, no problem. We had had uh, good use of the time, and and definitely like maybe before the next meeting, but you can we can do like a trial run to make sure you got all the sharing set up. That'd be good. Working excellent. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, please definitely uh, register any um, thoughts or ideas that you have um, for a future meeting on the wiki page, and then I'll send uh, some notes out about a follow up meeting. Perfect. Great. Thank thanks, you very thanks, much. Good. Thanks, everyone. This has Perfect. been really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And thank thanks, you thanks, thanks, thanks for too. organizing it and bringing it up. Yep. Thanks. Bye.